Welcome to Insights and Sound, where we talk to the people behind the scenes, behind the technology, and behind the music. People you may not know, but you should. We're here at the Summer NAM Show in Nashville, Tennessee, with engineer and audio legend Barry Rudolph. Oh, How boy. you doing, Barry? I'm doing great. Thank you, Daniel, for having me. Good to see um, you, man. So first of all, we'll get into a little bit of your career. You have been an engineer on so many different projects. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that is interesting to me is the fact that you have branched out into a lot of other disciplines, like writing right. and right. peer reviews and, and teaching and stuff like that. Right. And one of the conversations that I have a lot of times with students is that when you're 18, 20, mm -hmm. You have this goal in your head of, I'm going to be an X, Y, Z, whatever it is. And you are so laser focused on that. Yeah. And as careers progress and we start to realize that, A, we have other talents, mm -hmm. and B, they all kind of inform what we do, you kind of meander a little bit. And That's lots right. of times, That's, you know, you're focused there and you end up over here, yeah. you know, and yeah. stuff like that. So um, tell me a little bit about you know, what the early, what the early genesis of your career was and how it kind of changed. Well, I, I come from a love of electronics early on fifth grade, winning science fairs. And just, that was always there. Electronics, ham radio, taking stuff take, apart, taking stuff apart, <laughs> putting together, building Heath kit, mm -hmm. all those things, electronic, you know, nerd, geek, whatever they call it nowadays. And that, uh, that world kind of prepared me for a college to go to college and have an interest in electronics in college and get that bachelor's degree. And I worked nights because no one else was going to pay for college. So I worked nights at, uh, I got a job at a NASA contracted aerospace companies in Orange County. And so I would work five in the afternoon to two in the morning and then I would get up and go to college. <laughs> And I did that for five years, and I always tell people, that's why you're young. That's what, that's what you do when you're young. When you're young, you're indestructible. Yeah. We you know do, this, yes. You do stuff mm -hmm. like that. So yeah. uh, because I, it took me five years working nights, uh, it, that, you know, you can't work uh, 40 hours a week and take a full load. So I went to summer school. Anyway, I graduated, and I came out, and I was working at a place in Irvine. Was it Irvine, California? And they fired me for no real reason. And all of a sudden I'm fired and I, I managed to collect a little unemployment. And, but I really was, a, it was a turning point. I think students and young people need to know there's going to be a, a, a moment, an exact moment when you have a pivot. You have a pivot. You can, you can be depressed and all those kind of things like that. But then if you're, I feel like you, you need to like look at those talents you're talking about uh, uh, hidden talents, maybe, and kind of like see what else interests you. Well, I had the electronics interest. I had music interests from being in a band in high school. You know, we played Beatle covers and we were crappy, we were terrible, and, and whatever. And so I had the music and the electronics, and I went into the studio in Orange County, and there it was. It was a console and an eight track tape recorder. In a big room and the and the owner chief engineer knew all about is a jazz musician knew all about recording had great mic collection he would show me here's how you do it and uh paid didn't pay much michael omardian uh used to work down there once in a while and he says you know you got to get up to la if you want to be a recording engineer and that's where it's going on you know sure. and so i started and got a job at larrabee sound when they changed hands. Ah, um, I remember that studio. And uh, Jackie Mills bought it from Jerry Goffin. In, uh, nine, well, they closed the deal at the end of 1969, and I started almost immediately the first week, 1970. And you were one of the first engineers there after yeah, it changed staff, hands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, uh, and you know, it's a starting position. I'd already been engineering sessions down in Orange County, but you know, you, they don't know. So they put you on disc cutting, they put you on setting up. Nothing too next to the client, you know, kind of. But, you know, that's an interesting point because this is something that I've also had a lot of conversations with with people who, um, as you're coming up, mm -hmm. being able and being willing, first of all, to take on whatever gig it is, whatever job. That's essential. And then, 
You know, there's another thing that you mentioned earlier on that I kind of want to just circle back on really quickly, which is the idea of looking at, you know, when you're facing some kind of adversity, like being fired or whatever, looking at all the different things you can do. I call it thin slicing your career, you know, it's just figuring out, like, how many things can I do that can... It, very important. And, and the thing, I got fired and I, for no apparent reason. In fact, the guy who was my boss said... Well, we didn't think he liked his job. Did yeah. You, did you think to talk to him about it? Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so mm -hmm. that was, this was in a, a, what do you call it, arbitration with mm -hmm. the employee. Anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, you have to, it's not personal, I don't think, for the most part. I mean, you just have to go, wait a minute. It's not, doesn't really mean anything. I could have kept going. Uh -huh. I got another job somewhere else. I was like. Well, you did, yeah. essentially. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's the other interesting thing about it is that you, um, every single thing we do, there's a reason for it. And there is a path and, you know, the idea of just kind of allowing that path to illuminate as we're walking along it, you know, is really, you know, it's kind of the, the stock and trade of everyone's career in this industry mm -hmm. because that's what we tend to do. We don't have this... I, I mean, I know very few people in our industry who had a goal at the age of 18 and at the age of, you know, 30 or 40 have actually gotten to that goal. They've usually, right. they may have gotten to that goal, but they've, they've gone by way of, you know, some very circumlocutious path. That's right. And that tends to be what happens because there are so many, there are so many gigs in this industry that, you know, when I talk to students, they don't even know exist. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and... On the one hand, it's kind of cool to know that there are all these other options that you can learn about in school, for example. But there's also a whole lot of stuff that you kind of discover on your own, isn't there? Yeah, w sure. I mean, big part of it is just working with people and, and reading people and just being around people and being respectful of, of uh, people around you, workers. I mm -hmm. mean, a lot of life skills takes a while to learn because that's, you know, you, you come over, you come into those situations. So yeah, it's, I credit the education, first of all, uh, a technical education. I credit a lot. Um, I think that can cross all kinds of boundaries when you have a, a technical expertise. You could, I could sell uh, electronic gear. The mm -hmm. writing comes from that. I mm -hmm. have an interest in electronics. So reviewing, uh, a compressor or something makes total sense because I get inside of there and what makes this box worth what it costs and why would I want this over this other box? So mm -hmm. I think it, those things all merge together and I think that's, that's the power of education and of course, above all, interest. Now let's, let's talk about education for a moment because, yeah. <clears throat> excuse me, because your education and my education was a lot different than the education that people are able to get now. There weren't really recording schools. We learned by looking over people's shoulders. And I think there's both good and bad in that. Yeah. You know, I mean, on the one hand, I think it's wonderful that people can go to school now and mm -hmm. learn a lot of the basics. But I think there's also a lot of stuff that you can't learn. You know, I can teach somebody how to run a compressor. I can't teach them how to keep their mouth shut. Yeah. You know, life skills and just common courtesy and scoping out the room basically and, yeah, right? and reading looking, the room as you say looking at who you're working with here and and try not to be a jerk about stuff and try not to yeah, you're working in a room with a bunch of a bunch a lot many creative people uh and you have to respect what they do and not not uh you have to know when to be in the background and when to assert i guess there is the odd ego here and there yeah there's there's some ego sure Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, it's, it, I think the, I credit the electronics, the interest and, uh, in it, and also uh, for, the, for and the writing. I wasn't a great English student. I mean, it, I just something I credit a couple of people, editors. Uh, Bud Scapa used to sit with me with a red pen. And, oh, and, he was a legend. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and, and correct my, you know, he would read my mm -hmm. stuff I turned, which I typed on a typewriter. And, mm. and uh, the first early, and he would go, oh, no, you don't want to say it like this. You know, <laughs> you know and he was mm -hmm. cool about it. And mm -hmm. 
you made me sound really great. And when you need that when you're starting out on anything, you need that. And, and I also credit George Peterson, who his band was reviewed in Music Connection. This is kind of on the topic of how things connect together and how it's so important to, to when you make the connection, it, it, it's substantial. And George was the editor at Mix. And, and so I saw him at, I don't know, it was probably a NAMM show. And, I, and I, he, his band got a favorable review in Music Connection. Man, <laughs> why don't you write for me? And I go, oh, okay. And so next thing mm -hmm. I know, I'm writing for Mix. That's exactly how it happened. It's interesting, and, and you really have, um, what I think is interesting about the way you've done it is you've, you've continued to sort of intermingle mm -hmm. all those different things. You're still doing engineering, you're still yep. doing writing, you're still doing gear, you're still teaching. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one of the things that you just said kind of cued me on something that I've thought about a lot, which is the idea of A, don't be a jerk, and B, it's all about relationships. You know, in this industry, I mean, how many of us really have relationships, not only that date back mm -hmm. years and years, but mm -hmm. that kind of sprout out into other relationships. Mm -hmm. It's such mm -hmm. a networking thing. It is. Before the term networking was Before it even coined. existed. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and, and we used uh, to say, work your Rolodex, right? Yeah, work your Rolodex, <laughs> yeah. Uh, who do you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, all this. We'll but it on. really is true. And yeah. I think, um, you know, for me, and I'm sure the same was true for you, I would work a session and someone from that session might remember me or refer mm -hmm. me to somebody mm -hmm. else or people are just talking and they say, oh, you know, so-and-so. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that ends up being your next step to something else. And a lot yeah. of times it's really unexpected. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, I, I can count two or three times where the strangest thing... Record projects, for example. Uh, uh, here's a, an example. Just to, uh, Tom Dowd hired me to fly up to Toronto to work with Rod Stewart. Uh, I later learned that uh, Rod's engineer, Andy Johns, couldn't get into the country, either country. And so I'm, I had been working with Tom Dowd. And uh, so he says, Vandy, can you come up here? And I go, OK. I go up there. and and. Uh, what happened was Rod canceled a week early. It was supposed to be a two-week stint. And he, he canceled, and I think Tom Dowd felt bad that he canceled a whole week of work, which is, you know, a pretty good chunk of change. Sure. And so he, he uh, later called me and said, look, uh, I'm running over with Rod. Can you go down to uh, Doraville, Atlanta, and work with these guys? Just work with them for a week and hang with them until I get there. You'd be my representative. Okay. Well, the band was Leonard Skinner. <laughs> <laughs> so you work with Al Cooper? Well, no, he was, that was, this is after Al Cooper. Oh, this, this is, is after Tom Al. Dowd. Okay. Tom Dowd was producing him at this time. Uh -huh. And, and uh, uh, got down there. And another, another kind of quirky thing in, the, in, in music, you, I'm sitting there with Ronnie Van Zant right, first night in the hotel. And Ronnie's there. And Gary Rossington's over there. And, and Ronnie says, all the stuff we did with Tom Dowd and at Criteria is crap. We don't, we don't want it. We don't like a performance. We don't like the sound. We want to do it all over again. Oops. And <laughs> Tom had just kind of told me, yeah, just sit with them. They want to do guitars or some whatever. Just sit with them. And I thought I would be engineering some overdubs. You're so, tracking the whole thing again, huh? So I, you know, called up Tom, you know, like Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> and, and I said, you know, these guys... They want to cut all that stuff you guys already cut at Criteria. They want to do it over. And he's, you know, and Tom is like oh, the most blue sky person. He goes, ah, okay, well, yeah, go ahead. Cut, <laughs> cut it all over. You know, I got to go. I'll see you in a week, you know. And, and you were just kind of like, yeah, right? okay. And Yikes. so we get uh -huh. in the studio and, and uh, place, place in Doraville that Lana Rhythm Section owned. And, uh, and, they already had two engineers, and I'm just kind of the guy from the guy from L.A., the guy from Hollywood, uh, cracking the whip. And I just sat with them, and we we cut four songs, and and uh, one of them was a song called uh, "That Smell," mm -hmm. and it, it was on their Street Survivor album. And you know, and I I had a prior commitment, unfortunately, for that following week. And uh, so anyway, that's how things happen. Mm -hmm. Let me talk a little bit with you about technology, because obviously it's near and dear to you. Mm -hmm. 
what's fascinating to me and what is so important that I think a lot of times we lose sight of is the connection between the technology and the creative process. Mm -hmm. And you've been through yeah. so much evolution of mm -hmm. technology, mm -hmm. you know, going from eight track to 16, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera, going to nonlinear recording, mm -hmm. going to the idea that we have an undo key. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have, we don't have to use razor blades mm -hmm. and, and, you know, all of these things are to a certain extent, you know, they impact the creative process. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that has always fascinated me and at the same time frustrated me mm -hmm. is that I think earlier on, because we had certain technological limitations, mm -hmm. we had to work around those. Whereas now we almost have unlimited options and sometimes there's a paralysis because of those. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit for you about how the, the technical process, the technical changes have impacted the creative process in the studio. Um, well, first of all, there's way more people engineering, recording, producing, making music. So <laughs> it mm -hmm. would not be possible because if, if somehow you froze in time when I was coming up in the early 70s, if you froze in time the process, there wouldn't be enough studios in the population and the music. There wouldn't be enough room, people, or anything. So the only way that that's going to happen for more people making music is through technology. Having, having uh, now, you know, it's easy to have a home studio on a laptop. That's what's enabled uh, most of uh, the music you're hearing today, especially uh, self-recorded uh, music. Not everyone can go into Blackbird and, and cut a track in sure. any, or any studio. Uh, so I started in mono and two track when I was told to, when we mix, we always mixed a mono version and a stereo version for radio is mono, but on and on. I mean, it became easier, not easier, but better. I think, I think better and less, more control, less money spent overall. And uh, theoretically, uh, you'd be able to do better music. And I, I don't know that they, those exactly uh, go together. Yeah, you can do more music faster. Uh, in some cases, better quality. The, the technology... Um, Still need the talent. Yeah, and the thing that sort of has not really changed is talented, you know, you have to have talent. Yeah. You have to write a good song. Nobody's invented a talent plug-in yet. No, and, and uh, so... Within, people get the mistaken idea that if they have a jillion tracks and be able to fly in, punch in, tune, all those things, that they're going to make a better, uh, a, a better uh, music. Mm -hmm. You could. Some people completely rely on that stuff to even make anything that sounds like anything. But still, you've got to have a song. It's an you know, old story, yeah. you know, song. The, the songs, the talent, the creative juices, yeah. all of that stuff. And I think to a certain extent, you have to have also that creative vibe, yeah. you know, and that's something, um, you know, in, in, in my days in the studio, as well as in yours, there were certain unwritten laws about, mm -hmm. you don't mess with certain things in the session. You no. do your best to keep that creative flow going. Yeah. And all of that, I think, doesn't matter if you're on a laptop and somebody's... Yeah studio apartment or if you're in yeah. a great studio that is still an essential aspect. don't disturb this groove yeah yeah and and uh that of course and uh i don't know i i think i'm a pretty i'm i think i'm a pretty good judge of somebody that has the vibe when they walk into the room almost mm -hmm. I, you know, i've seen it a few times and uh, I mean, it's not like every time they walk into the room. But, no, but you can tell. You can tell if somebody's got a certain gift about them, I think. Generally, I mean, in a general statement, I mean, they have a focus. The focus is manifested in certain ways that you may not recognize right away, but they have a focus. In other words, they are, they are self-directed on, on a certain goal, and they know how to get there, or they have a pretty good idea how to get there. No one knows everything to get there but they have a pretty good idea you know if they're writing a song they start with lots of different ideas and uh, they kind of get come back to a certain one they're kind of attracted to and uh, on and on so you can i i've really kind of seen that and i've also seen some very wrong-headed uh uh directions with with artists 
And uh, it's not a situation that I would try to correct them. I wouldn't try to. No, of course not. But I think it's um, there you get into the whole idea of the psychology of the producer uh, artist relationship yep. and all of that. And there again, that's something that I feel I was very privileged to be able to look over the shoulder of some of these great producers mm -hmm. and learn because, that, as I say, the technical stuff, no problem. Mm -hmm. I can learn almost any piece of gear mm -hmm. given a certain amount of time. But the idea of how one relates to the artist, the idea of that studio mm -hmm. dynamic, mm -hmm. all of that is so... It's not just that it's volatile, because it is volatile to a certain extent, even with the best artists, mm -hmm. you know, one wrong word mm -hmm. can just kind of crush oh, yeah. whatever vibe is happening. But mm -hmm. I think it's also, um, it can work the other way, you know, if you know how to feed Manip that dynamic. Yeah, and you can manipulate. You can, you can, and you can coax such a great performance out of people. And so Ma I'm- Manipulate uh, being kind of a strong- Yeah, yeah, word, well, but... manipulate in a positive sense, though you are- Well, it's- you want to, the producer should set up the vibe, should mm -hmm. set up the working vibe for the, for the room and the studio, even the choice of the studio, the choice of the engineer. Mm -hmm. The whole thing is on the producer's shoulder. And uh, one thing I've noticed about new music makers, it, it ten, tendency to be one person becomes the producer, the engineer, co-writer. And it's like a lot of stuff. And I suppose it's possible, but it would be, I think, they might make a better record if some of that was delegated in some way. Well, and that's, you know, that, that's an interesting <laughs> yeah. thought because, you know, we've both worked in the studio with producers who are very much wearing both hats, yep. engineer, producer. Yeah. And that's wonderful because they can play the instruments, you right. know, the, the technology. Directly, but at the yeah. same time, you get a really great team. Yeah. You know, um, I... Um, Trying to remember, there was a great session once with Don Waz and uh, Ed Cherney yeah. at Cherokee. Yeah. And I was in the room for a while just watching the two of them. Yeah. And they were reading each other's minds, I yeah. swear. You know, yeah. I mean, Don would look over at something and Ed would reach over and, yep. you know, it, it just that kind of vibe. Yeah, I sure. Think. It's like brains in sync, mm -hmm. you know? Really and there work. again, that gets all of that stuff out of the way so that the artist mm -hmm. can do the artist thing. Yeah. And that's when you get those inspired moments, I think. Yeah. So it's, it's uh, really is, it is kind of the vibe of the whole thing. And that's why, you know, the giving engineers and producers have to be giving people, I believe you have to be able well, to it's a service industry. It is, you know, it is. A and we lose recording sight of, that a of lot. being an engineer is a mm -hmm. service oriented business. It's true. And we lose sight of that a lot, you know, and especially because of the way that the studio traditionally has evolved. Mm -hmm. It's evolved into a thing of, uh, you know, we want to make this comfortable like your living room. Mm -hmm. And that's great. But then we sort of forget about the idea that, yeah, you know, that also means we're going to bring you lunch, we're going to do whatever it is yeah. to maintain yeah. that vibe and that creative environment and that's you know you know or not or yeah, not exactly you, you read you might read the artist in the situation like no you're not going to do that you're going to make them uh, uh take them out of their element maybe. exactly not, not exactly make them feel comfortable because if they get too comfortable it's going to be a different thing and i've seen i've seen producers manipulate situations where the artist has to work harder, but the result, and that is really the true, true genius of the great producers, that they kind of somehow or another know what the best route to get to right. something. Right, like maybe take them to a different city where they don't right. have their hangs and stuff like that. Right, where yeah. they don't have their friends around. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, that's going to affect sure. it. Everything. The old expression was everything gets on the tape. Yep. And you, wait a minute. Or you could say everything gets on the hard drive. Everything gets <laughs> everything gets recorded. Wait a minute. Once we had tape, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it's everything everything affects the the, the final result in some way. Mm -hmm. Some some ways less, some way more. Okay. Say the producer used to work with a guy that liked liked a really cold control room and studio. I mean like hanging meat. And every, <laughs> you know, that cold, and everyone everyone would complain and complain and he would just say, wear a jacket or something. So the next day, everybody's got overcoats on. 
you know, and that's going to affect, and you can complain, the artist complain, and he just didn't care and mm -hmm. wear a coat. And he would make up some kind of health reason or whatever, but, but I think it was drugs. And uh, Yeah, you know, yeah. The, the, there, were, there was a little bit of that, you know, yeah. here and there, yeah. But I, I, I love some of the artists I've worked for. They're so focused, you know. Mm -hmm. I remember when I worked there with Daryl Hall and John Oates at Larrabee, the first day, they'd come over to the house. Daryl was before. always like that. Well, they had come over to the house the previous day. I had uh, just bought a house in Sherman Oaks in California, and the producer and Daryl and John came over the day before just to kind of meet and greet. And uh, next day at the session, John, John Oates, Larrabee had this, when you walked into Studio A, it was, it mm -hmm. was down. Yes. And you walked in these steps, three or four steps down to the control room floor, and John was up on this thing, the doorway with the handle, and he says, he came in and, and uh, he said, announced, we're working on the first single today. And I'm thinking, wow. <laughs> this, you know, that's I had, directed. I don't, mm -hmm. you know, that's like, and they were that way. They're always that way. Mm -hmm. And that comes from working with the Reef Mardine and, and Atlantic and yeah. uh, Ahmed Erdogan and those people, record people. And, uh, yeah, we cut the first single that day, and we cut it again, and we cut it a third time. In mm -hmm. fact, we did the string overdubs twice, trying to get that right. And guess what? Nothing happened with that song. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, and that's, that's part of it, too, is, I mean, you know, you're walking in the studio, and you're kind of rolling the dice. You know, is this going to be the right place? Are these the right people? Are mm -hmm. they in the right frame of mind today mm -hmm. yeah. this particular moment and all of that is just it's lightning in a bottle you yeah, know it as well as i do yeah. and you know i mean we've watched some amazing people yeah do some amazing things and yeah. you know we've watched some train wrecks yeah oh a lot of train wrecks mm -hmm. you don't see those too much you don't no you don't but they're the great stories that we can tell off camera <laughs> yeah i mean it's part of the creative process it it's is not it is it's not a neat and tidy uh you know thing, you do this, you do that, boom, you die. Well, you know, there's that great old Shakespeare saying, um, which I think applies to music as well. Uh, the, the original saying is, those who appreciate great sausage and the law should never watch either being made. Yeah, that's right. And I add records to yeah. that as well. You know, what is it, records, have, laws, yeah. sausage, yeah. Anything, anything, I mean, You the don't actual, want to know about it. Exactly, you really don't. But. You know, that's one of the things about it is when you do it right, mm -hmm. when everything does come together, man, you've got some stuff, you yeah. know, that just, it, it, it just touches so many people. And that for me is what drew me into this in the first place yep. and keeps me going is the idea that there's a possibility that something that we work on and record is going to strike literally a chord with someone. That's, that's what you're going for. And, you know, yeah. people come up to you and they say, you know, that song just saved my life. Yeah, man, and, that's that's everything. And to you me. can't you can't predict that outcome. No, nope. it's it's another one of those weird things in the music business that that just is unexplained. Yep, it, it's uh, if you want to call it magic, but it's just something that you can't. Those connections that work out to be something great. Mm -hmm. Most of the ones you don't talk about are the ones that didn't work out so great. <laughs> and and uh, it's just it's fascinating to me, and it. it it, but the whole thing is those opportunities have happen for a reason, and they happen because you're prepared for them to happen. And maybe it's a, I think, like to think it's an experience, of course. There's an education. There's a certain kind of wisdom that comes with it. And there's also a, a tendency not to prejudge a situation or have a, 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 you know, a negative outlook in general. And I find the negative outlook is very off-putting to me. People immediately, when you say something, oh, that'll never happen, all right, you know. Yeah. And it's like, okay, grumpy old man, number 88, 5,000. And half the time, <laughs> you're, you're, you're going to stand there and they're going to be arguing about something that is, you know, it, it will take me less time to just try it yeah. than to argue about it. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah, it's Craig. Yeah. Well, Barry Rudolph, thank you for being our guest. Sure. sure. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure, completely. Hey, I'm Daniel Keller. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and join us each week for Insights and Sound.